Hello everyone, my name is Jan Fesselatz and I'm your trans mask and by artist who draws men and queer love stories for a living. But also, I adore to go deep into painting skills in different mediums and share my tips and tricks with you. Today I'm going to talk about delicious, luxurious silk and how to make it look real and chic without spending hours on it. I will be using Clip Studio Paint as my app of choice, since I think it's a perfect app for a professional artist. In this tutorial, I'm going to break the process of painting silk into simple steps, which are very easy to understand and to follow. So you can just follow along and get the best results. By the way, this is the first tutorial about fabrics out of the free which I'm planning. To make this tutorial 100% accessible to all, I will be using only free assets from the Clip Studio Asset Library. All links are in the caption below, so feel free to download those tools and use them for the best. Oh, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe button before we start. Okay, here we go. Let's start with analyzing the references to understand what we are dealing with. This is the first step which I usually recommend to everyone. The defining factor about silk is its glossiness and reflectivity. As you can see on my reference pictures, the fabric reflects light very well, so we will need really bright highlights and saturated reflected light areas to make it look realistic. Silk and fabrics need sharper edges and deeper shadows because of the value difference between highlighted and shadowed areas. So keep in mind that very bright highlights are a key feature. Silken fabrics come in different weight, uh, but it's generally flowy and folds really well. It's also important to know that folds are most likely structured. Silk tends to be smoother in some areas, like here for example, and fold quite significantly in the bottom due to gravity. Now, let's quickly make some notes about line art. I'm not going to cover the full line art process here, since the main focus of this video is the coloring process, but I can't leave you without some important tips and tricks about line art, because I'm a line art guy, I just love this part of the work. First of all, I suggest that you pay attention to basic shapes and how different fabrics interact with them. Work on the line weight and accentuate the folds and the creases with thicker and more structured lines, while keep the lines that are closer to the light or more delicate with a more flowy quality. Mix flowy lines and more sharp and angular ones for dynamics and organic shapes. Try to avoid doing something like this, you see like those just wobbling lines, they don't look really well, even though they kind of seem um, natural when you begin, but that's not what you want to do. Don't go 100% after the reference. Actually, this advice uh, works with all kinds of stuff which you use your references for. You don't really have to copy every little detail. Don't follow every wrinkle and fold of your fabric. As artists, we need to be deliberate about what we keep, and what we skip from reference. That keep skip ratio is a really important thing to consider. I will be using neutral gray background because it's better for my eyes and that's a very personal preference, but I prefer to see my values without such a high contrast background as the white color because the white is like the, the most lightest thing in the painting and if it's the background I might not get the values quite right. So. I suggest this to you as well, but of course I do the line art on the white paper and then I just turn the color into something less saturated. Now we're on to the flat coloring. So first we make our line art layer, our reference layer, by toggling this little beacon button with this layer selected. I use the fill tool for quick color blocking. You can copy my settings though, you will have to play with them probably with each individual line art you're working with because it really depends on how clean it is and I actually suggest that you make it just clean enough so it would be easier for the program to work but you don't have to overstress it, it's not necessary, just try not to make it you know, too messy with too many gaps. Since the fill tool is clever, I can quite simply select my figure and get the perfect result. After that, I color fill the pants on a separate layer just so it would look like okay for us. Now we're on to some real fun and we are going to be using some Clip Studio Paint assets which are gradient maps. They are super cool, very useful and they kind of speed up your process quite a lot if you know how to use them. First of all, you will have to install a gradient map set. To do that, follow the link in the description below and uh, click install. It will automatically install into your app and will appear at your downloads folder right here. 
I already have this installed, but I will show you how to do that so you don't get lost. Choose any gradient from the basic ones and duplicate it, like just in case if you want to keep it. Then go to settings and choose advanced settings. Click on add gradient set, choose downloads in text and you will see your downloaded sets. Then choose the one that you like and double click on the gradient which you see here. So now you have um, it in your gradient list. To change the color, I use the eye picker to take my darkest dark mid-tone and lightest light from the palette which I already have and uh, place them accordingly with the bucket tool like you can see it don't confuse those little squares where you kind of drop the color with the arrows with which you move the mixers because this is how actually a gradient will work so this is also how you can adjust it voila there you have it a perfect silken gradient now I create another layer on top of my flat layer. Then I turn it into clipping mask right here and uh, move the gradient tool to adjust the results. So you will have to play a little with that and according to where your lights are seen, how do you like how saturated it is, just play along, try different combinations of the movement. I use it according to the reference that suggests that the light source comes from above. In the end, I merge those two layers into one single color layer because I personally prefer not to have too many layers and to work with like one, two, maybe three ones. Of course, that rule has some exceptions. There are some projects which require a lot of layers, but in this case, we really don't need more than a couple of them. Now we're on to the basic shadows. I will be using the lasso tool to block the basic shadows here. I suggest that you try thinking about shapes more than anything else when you have to do with shadow and light. Like you have to carve the shapes out of your basic color by using shadows. So try to draw shapes, not things, not the creases, not the folds, shapes that they create. To use the lasso tool correctly and effectively, you need to use short keys. If you select an area and then just click outside of your selection, then it will be gone. You will just start another selection. So you need to use Shift and Alt keys to add or cut from your selection. Before starting, I create another layer on top of my main layer and turn it into a clipping mask. I select all of the shadows and I try to follow the rule that the more angular the shapes look, the more organic it is with silk. When I'm happy with my selection, I take the airbrush tool and start painting in my shadows. Then I take a blending brush. I use Mirrors Blender, that's my favorite. You can also download it for free, following the link in the caption below. And then I start to merge in the shadows a little bit. As you see, I make sure to keep some of the edges sharp while soften up the others. I merge the two layers and uh, blend the colors a little bit more. Now we're on to the basic lights. Actually, we'll just repeat all previous steps, but with the light areas. So there's nothing really new about this. I prefer to work with the lasso tool at this stage to keep my edges sharp. It also makes me think in solid shapes and prevents me from going too much into detail at this stage where it's too early for details. Right now, my aim is to build the light and shadow map for my future drawing. Now we're going to work a little with the blending modes, which are also a lifesaver because they really speed up your workflow very much. On a new layer set to clipping mask, I will toggle glow dodge adjustment layer and add some glow to the highlighted parts of the shirt. I also use overlay blending mode to add some warm and greenish color to the shirt so it wouldn't be boring, as well as some bluish green and dark red shadows. Green and red are complementary colors, so no matter if red seems to be a warmer tone than greenish blue, and there is a myth that shadows always must be cooler than lights, I highly suggest always adding some complementary color in your shadows, it will give a lot of vibrance. Color temperature is relative. Also we have cold lights, so warmer shadows will look more natural. Now when the pre-render phase is already done, we have to tone our line art. I block the alpha channel on the liner layer, so all adjustments will affect only the liner, but not the space around it. Then I take the airbrush and tone it. It's I will eventually merge it into the painting, but I prefer to start with toning to make it easier afterwards. I prefer to avoid the black color and even in those parts of the line art that indicate the darkest shadow, I make it the same color as my painting but really dark, like very dark bluish green or the shadow color, very dark reddish hue. Now we're onto the main thing, the render. 
At this point, I suggest that you duplicate your pre-render color layer and the line art layer to save the copy if something goes south and it can always go south, so I would suggest that you do this. I create a new group, put the duplicates in it, you can rename it if you want to, and then I mute it, so like it's there, but it doesn't interfere with my current work, it just makes me sure that I can go back to it if I mess up with my painting. Usually to render almost anything, I use a combination of just a couple of brushes. Dense watercolor is the main brush for sharper edges and more saturated color strokes, like when you want to drop in some color. It also blends with underlying colors a bit, but not too much, and it kind of gives texture, and if you push harder on it, it will give you a hard, like solid edge. The second brush is a transparent watercolor, it's kind of the opposite of the dense one. It's very good for the color blending. This brush is much, much softer and gives a very diluted and desaturated strokes while dragging a bit of the underlying color as well. It's very good for blending without making the surface too smooth and it's not completely transparent, it does has a little bit of hue to it. I use my good for sketching brush for sharp edges and small details. It's kind of very versatile in fact. Then I use Mirror's Blender for stronger blending, but no additional color in the stroke. And basically the technique is to drop some color with the dense watercolor, then blend it in and uh, add some variety with the transparent watercolor, and then blend even more with Mirror's Blender, while carving out some sharper edges and adding detail with good for sketching brush. That's as simple as that. I can't stress enough how important is the ratio between soft and sharp edges. It becomes even more important to keep this balance when we use the soft blending tool, which I'm going to talk about right now. It's a very tricky tool, mind you. You have to be really careful using it to avoid the extra smoothed out look that feels way too digital. Unless that's what you really want to achieve, for sure. If this is your goal, then go for it. At this point, I use a bit of this extra softening and smoothing blending brush to achieve that smooth silky look. I use it carefully and only slightly in some areas, and then I add some sharp edges to balance it out. This tool can do miracles when you need a silky and smooth surface, but only in limitation and with counterbalancing sharp edges. During your rendering process, try to avoid going too much into detail. As you can see, I tend to zoom in quite rarely and only when I need to clean up some edges and add small details. The trick is that the human eye tends to simplify what it sees. We only see sharply those parts of the object that we focus our attention on, while all other things are out of focus and seem kind of blurry. If you overload your drawing with too much details, making everything sharp and detailed, it just does the opposite and makes your render look artificial and too digital. Of course, there are specific styles that want just that, and if that's your goal, good for you. But if you want your silk texture to look realistic or semi-realistic, I suggest that you avoid overloading your painting with too much detail and choose what is in focus and what's out of that. This choice will affect how details each area should be. I start to blend in my line art by merging it with the color layer. It's rather easy since it was already toned with matching colors, so it wouldn't look grayish or muddy. Don't forget about reflected light on the bottom of the creases, it's the light that hits the ground and bounces back to the surface of the shirt. Since silk is extremely reflective as a material, it catches reflected light quite well even in shadow. We're almost done, hold on, we're getting there. Now the fun thing is the highlights. I make another add glow layer and start adding highlights to the most protruding edges that catch most light. And what's important, what I want my viewers gaze to focus on, you know, light is your attention seeker. <laughs> light is something that you can point the attention of your viewer with. Point your light to the place where you want your viewers eyes to look to. The same logic actually applies to highlights as with blending, like you don't really want to overdo it. If you make too many highlights, your audience does not know where to look at, everything is too shiny. So to make the highlights look more realistic, I make just very few light spots here and there where the light hits and then blend it a little bit from side to side so it kind of gets dispersed on the surface. I decided 
to change the background to a complementary color. Actually, this is a very normal thing. You don't really have to follow the reference. I just felt like I wanted another color here. So I went to the edit mode, chose the tonal correction and toggled the hue and saturation slider. So now I'm having this reddish purple because I love it more. And we're done. Thank you so much for watching. And I also hope that now you will feel more comfortable with painting still with clip to do paint tools. And now the big reveal. In my next video, I will talk about drawing a men's suit. So make sure to subscribe not to miss it. And I would love it if you like this tutorial on the Clip Studio Paint page to help me win the tips competition. If you want me to cover some other subject in my Clip Studio Paint tutorials, please let me know in the comments below. Be well, stay creative and bye bye!